y'all, Dixie here. It is a blustery day in the 100 mile wood, as they say in Winnie the Pooh. So I'm hoping this covered bridge is gonna help me with the wind a little bit. But today I want to answer more silly questions. Once a year, I put out a post on social media asking folks to share with me any questions they have that maybe they've been too shy or embarrassed to ask in the past. So there are gonna be multiple questions today. The only thing that they really have in common potentially is backpacking. And if you wanna skip ahead to any of those, there will be timestamps in the video description. The first question is, I would like to know how you all measure distance. For instance, how do you know you are 100 feet from a water source? To hang a bear bag, to dig a cat hole, if I'm a size six shoe, would that equal two steps for one foot? I learned how to approximate 100 feet when I was working doing surveying jobs in the past. So it's something that I never thought, you know, the general public may not know how to do this. So basically anywhere that you could go to measure out 100 feet, whether that's a sidewalk in your neighborhood or whatever, you wanna stretch out a tape measure. Now your tape measure may not be 100 feet. So if it's 25, for example, you would do 25, mark that spot 25 more until you build up to 100. Then you're going to start with your toes at the beginning of that 100 foot line and walk that distance at your normal stride. I'd do this a few times and kind of see once you get your comfortable stride and then see how many steps you take in that 100 feet. You could even do it a few times and then take the average if you want to. For myself, I have about 33 to 34 steps in 100 feet. If I need to go 200 feet, then I double that. And you'll find that most people have a stride of like two to four feet per step. The next question is, I'm only able to do day hacks. Am I looked down upon by the distance hackers? I feel like most people who like to go out in nature and spend time in the woods don't really care what other people are doing there. They're not usually interrogating folks or you know, judging people about what they're doing because they're so busy there spending their own time in nature and enjoying themselves. But of course I can't speak for everyone and there are some jerk kids who grow up to be jerk adults who might look down upon you, but who cares what they think? As long as you're getting out there in the capacity that you can and you're enjoying nature, then I think you're making yourself a better person. So I wouldn't worry about that and I'd just keep at it. Next is my biggest fear for my upcoming through hike. What do you do when you gotta go, like there's no waiting, no choice, and it's not remote or private or no tree cover and the privy is too far? And how do you go cat hole style in pouring rain? I was particularly worried about this when I started my PCT through hike because I knew going from the AT where there was the green tunnel, the forest all around to the PCT, Pacific Crest Trail, that there would be a lot of exposed areas. But the truth is, when you're in a very exposed area, like you can see forever, then you're gonna know if there's somebody around who's close enough to see exactly what you're doing. And if somebody is super far away, and you do see them pop up over a ridge, they're gonna be so far away that while they may know what you're doing, they're not gonna be able to like see the detail of what you're doing. And you'd be surprised in a pinch when you can find things to hide behind. Whether that's like lower ground and there's kind of, you know, a ridge that you can duck behind. Or on long road walks of the Florida Trail, I've used my umbrella to pop it open and kind of use that to block myself from going to the bathroom. If you use a rain poncho instead of a rain jacket and rain pants, you can always put that on and go up under that. Or hold up your shelter to kind of shield yourself if you need to or have it ready to go if somebody does walk up so at least they don't see everything. With areas of tree cover, obviously if it's thick enough, you're good, you'll be able to hide. And if it's super thin, then just use these other ideas. Like I said, just use something to try to shield yourself. But what I tend to do is leave my pack on the trail because long distance backpackers kind of learn that if you see a pack on the trail, that means somebody's off trying to go to the bathroom, go doo doo. So <laughs> you see that pack and you go, oh, I need to not look around right now and give this person their privacy. So that's kind of a universal marker to let other folks know what's happening. But remember that everybody out there is gonna be in the same boat as you are. So even if you have the most embarrassing situation and somebody catches you going to the bathroom, I mean, it happens. And as far as the rain goes, 
you just have to embrace the suck. I mean, it's already not fun to have to go to the bathroom in the woods, but then to have to go to the bathroom in the woods and get rained on is terrible. But you won't care because if you're going in the woods in the rain, then that means you have to go bad enough that you're not worried about the rain too much. But having your rain gear on and just pulling down your britches and going, and this is another time where I like to have an umbrella because at least you can hold it over your head and, you know, block some of that rain. Next up is, have you ever seen a pack goat on trail and which trails would allow them? I have seen several pack animals on trail, but I'm not sure about goats specifically. I do remember in the Wind River Range seeing some pack animals and I did a little Googling and found that there are companies who have pack goats for that area. I'm sure a lot of the longer trails like the Pacific Crest Trail and Continental Divide Trail where they allow horses and really any trail that allows horses probably allows other pack animals. With that said, I can't say that that is a definite blanket rule and that if horses are allowed, goats are also allowed. You may have to contact that specific park or whatever body kind of governs that trail area. But I can say for sure on the Appalachian Trail that it's human foot traffic only and horses, goats, etc., are not allowed. But anyway, yes, it does happen. The next question is, how do people with dogs prevent their ground sheets from getting damaged by their dog's claws? For me with Fancy May, I honestly didn't even think about that before I took her backpacking but it was never an issue. With that said, she is a pretty chill dog in the tent. She kind of goes 90 to nothing all day. And then when she gets in the tent, she gets on her sleeping pad and kind of passes out. So she's not super active in the tent. But if your dog is more active, there are ways to mitigate it. First, it will always help to make sure that your dog's nails are freshly trimmed because that way they don't have these talons to dig into the bottom of the tent. You can also get nail caps for your dog's nails. I don't know how easy those are to put on and off. I don't have personal experience with them. I just know they exist. And then also you could get something like a polycryo ground cloth. It's pretty cheap and lightweight to line on the inside of your tent just for an extra layer to hopefully prevent against puncturing. So hopefully one of those options will help you out. School let out and the park got popular, so had to move. But continuing on, anyone ever have a Bigfoot encounter? Personally, no. After 10,000 plus miles of hiking in the woods, I have never seen nor heard anything strange or that I at least attributed to being a Bigfoot or seen tracks or doo-doo that I couldn't identify. And it seems like a lot of people are actually surprised by that because I get asked this question a lot. But nowadays I hack with a trail cam, so he's gonna have to be super sneaky to evade me going forward. But I'm gonna be real honest, if I were to play back that trail cam and saw a Bigfoot, I would crap my pants. But according to the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, there have been either sightings or clues that a Bigfoot has been spotted on or near the Triple Crown trails. You can poke around on their database and see whether it was an actual sighting or just some sort of indication that a Bigfoot had been in the area. And it's kind of cool because they go into detail on these things like who the person was that reported the sighting and how credible they may have sounded and like what they do for a living. But anyway, I just found several examples on or near the Triple Crown trails. So I'm sure if you included all of the trails in the United States that are used for hiking, there would be a whole lot more. But again, personally, no. The next question is, is it wise to test out your bear mace? I noticed mine have expiration dates and I just keep buying more. Right now I have three canisters that are technically expired, but I'm wondering if I can test them to see if they still function properly so I can keep them. That being said, how do you safely dispose of bear spray canisters so they don't end up exploding or being mishandled? It seems like it's better safe than sorry when it comes to minding the expiration date on bear mace. From what I read, it's actually the propellant that goes bad in the bear spray not the spray itself so you, you don't want that to go bad because then you probably mash the button and just it kind of oozes out instead of you know 
doing what you need it to do in a situation where a bear is coming after you. So even if your can still feels heavy and you shake it and it sounds like, hey, this is still good, it may not function properly if it's past that expiration date. But to dispose of them, apparently the easiest way that I could find online is to actually empty the contents of the bear spray and then the canister is fine to toss like it is. So you do get to at least practice using the bear spray. And to me, I feel like that's always a good idea. I've wanted to test out bear spray, but I, I never have. But at least if you're in that situation where you're having to use it, it's familiar to you going through that act of pulling it out and spraying the same thing. If you're gonna carry a firearm, you should be practiced with it. But I would caution you to be very attentive to what the breeze is doing the day you decide to test it out. And even still, spraying pepper spray, like regular pepper spray, I've done that in a situation before, and I did get a little bit of it in my face and on my hands, and so if it's on your hands, it can get in other places. So anyway, I would just use extreme caution with that and know that that is a risk you're taking. But if you don't want to fool with emptying the contents of the bear spray, totally get that and you might check with your local law enforcement or fire station because sometimes they have ways to dispose of those things because police officers carry pepper spray and if it's not used, it can be expired and they have to do something with it. Next up is what is the best or easiest way to pack toothpaste just as a travel size tube? I'm picky and the brand flavor I use isn't available in travel size. So I actually saw one person who replied to this question. What they do is they use their normal preferred brand of toothpaste that comes in a big tube up until the point where it has approximately how much a travel size tube of toothpaste would have in it. And then they put it with their gear to be used on their next backpacking trip. So they just do this every time they get a new tube it's almost used up, they put it with their backpacking gear. Now, you would still have some excess of container or plastic, so it would be a little bit heavier than a travel size tube, I would assume, but it's still gonna be more lightweight than carrying a big old tube of toothpaste. Another option is dehydrating some toothpaste, your preferred brand, and making toothpaste dots. I've never done this myself, but I saw a tutorial video where somebody did and they put out parchment paper, some little dots of toothpaste and set it to dehydrate on a lowish temperature for 10 hours or so. I also saw on a website where somebody put some little dabs of toothpaste on like a paper plate and just let it go until it dried. So you could dehydrate, you could air dry, but it seemed like the consensus was that some brands don't dry out as well as others. So you'll just have to see how yours does with that. Of course, there are also companies who sell toothpaste dots or tabs and you can find them on the Garage Grown Gears website. But I assume they're gonna be pretty limited on the different brands and flavors that they have. So if you're not so picky as to buy toothpaste tabs from this website, then you might be best just going with whatever trial size of toothpaste that you can find. The next question is, as a female multi-day hiker, is it acceptable to wear your underwear for multiple days? Yes, regardless of whether you are a male or a female, wearing your underwear multiple days on a backpacking trip is completely normal. And I would say that having a pair for each day of your backpacking trip is less normal than wearing one pair multiple days. So the way that I prefer to do this is I carry two pair of underwear with me. I'll wear one the first day, then I'll turn it inside out and wear it the second day. I know that the bacteria is probably still there and it doesn't matter turning it inside out, but I just prefer that. And then the third day I start with the second pair of underwear. And then while hiking on that third day, I will find some sort of water source to do some trail laundry and rinse out that pair of underwear really well downstream from where people are collecting their water, mind you. And then I'll hang it on my pack to dry. So by the time I get to the fifth day, after wearing that second pair for two days, on day five, I put on the first pair again that is now clean-ish and dry. And the next question is, any bra or backpack suggestion for girls with larger chests, like really larger, a 36GH to be exact, need support without wires and not squish flat. And some packs I've tried are definitely not friendly to the girls. So because I'm not as well endowed as 
some other backpacking ladies. I put this question out there on a post to get some feedback. For the bra side of things, there were several recommendations, but the main brand that was voted on was the SheFit brand. There are different fits and levels of compression, so each individual can adjust things to suit them and their needs. But some other brands that were thrown out there are Free Label, Glamorize, and Lunaire. Some of the ladies who commented said that the best thing that they ever did was have a breast reduction and lift done, but I understand that's not an option for everybody. As far as the packs go, the consensus was the ULA brand. There were different models that these ladies used, but apparently what they liked the best about ULA is the option for the S-curve shoulder straps because it just works best for a curvy chest. Next up is what's the best way to greet fellow hackers? Hello, a small wave, a head nod, or just a grunt? I definitely get the awkwardness of passing a fellow hacker in the middle of the woods, especially when you can see them coming from like forever away. So you've got this long awkwardness <laughs> until you reach each other. And it's like, what do you say? But I'd say the best bet is to just be yourself. So if you're in a happy mood and you want to say, hey, or you know, you're not really feeling talking to somebody and you want to keep it at a minimal head nod, then just go with what you're feeling. Sometimes I'm so happy to run into somebody while I'm backpacking that I just want to talk because I haven't seen a human in forever. But I would say on that side of things to, to try to be observant of the other person and kind of see what their energy is because maybe they're out there and they don't want to talk to people because they talk to people all the time, you know? So I try to be respectful of that as well. The next question is, I never sleep much before a big hike. Always thinking I may have forgotten something I must have with me. I'm really excited on day one, but tired by day two when lack of sleep pops up. What do I do? I wish I had a good answer for you on this. Uh, I find myself in the same boat. I think a lot of my issue before backpacking trips has been lack of organization and procrastination, which was also probably due to lack of organization. I have remedied that and I actually just did a video on how I have organized all of my gear. So I hope that that's gonna help me going forward to actually get my packing done ahead of time so I can go to sleep at a decent time the night before, or at least lay in the bed and try to go to sleep. And of course, I don't know your exact situation, but I think if you can pack ahead of time, like kind of well ahead of time, and then you've got a chance to go back through everything maybe two or three times, to know that you have it all would be useful. And while you're going through all of it, if you actually have a list printed out and maybe even laminated if you wanna get real crazy with it so you can mark off each thing so you really make sure it's all there, then I don't know, I guess having that peace of mind of making the list and checking it twice could help. And then maybe the day before your trip, instead of rushing around and packing up stuff, you can do something completely relaxing instead of rushing around getting ready for that backpacking trip or checking the list 12 times. But anyway, if all else fails and nothing helps, it's completely normal to be anxious and nervous before a backpacking trip because you're going from the comforts of everyday life to throwing yourself out in the woods and hoping you got what you need. So I think that that's normal and I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. And our last question is, any advice from anyone wearing hearing aids? I can't speak on this from personal experience, but with this question, again, I made a separate post on Facebook to get some feedback from people who could weigh in. And it seems like some people prefer rechargeable hearing aids. Others prefer hearing aids that take batteries that can be replaced. So you just bring some backups with you. I guess that's really personal preference, but it seems like both options are viable as long as you're gonna do the recharging route, you have a backup battery bank. It seems for the people who prefer recharging, they typically do it at night. There was one commenter that said her husband prefers to sleep with one in at night. Among the people who commented, there was an emphasis on making sure that the hearing aids are kept dry. Although some people said there are some models now that are water resistant. But on keeping them dry, some folks said when they're going on an incline and they know they're fixing to get sweaty, one person uses a sweatband and some of the others say they just remove them so that there is no issue with that. On rainy days, it sounds like having a hood from a poncho or a rain jacket pretty well does the trick at keeping those hearing aids dry or 
you could always remove them just like with the inclines if you don't want to risk it. One hacker said he carries a few Tech Care drying pouches to help with moisture issues. And I assume these could be just used at night while you're sleeping if you take them out anyway. And someone else said they find it helpful to put a sign on their pack saying that they're hearing impaired. So if somebody comes up and wants to pass, I assume, and they don't have their hearing aids in, then that person at least knows why you're not paying them any mind. That same commenter said that they are planning to upgrade the current set of hearing aids that they have to a water resistant pair and then they're going to hold on to the older pair to be used at night. So that would be one instance where you could have some during the day and then some at night. I guess the daytime ones could be charging while you're using the other ones at night. But if anybody else watching is hearing impaired and you go backpacking with your hearing aids, or even if you don't, you choose to leave them at home because there were definitely some people that said that, please feel free to chime in in the comments below because again, I don't have personal experience. So the more the merrier with information. Well, all right, y'all, that is all I have for you today. If you've got a question that you've been a little shy to ask before, uh, this is a no judgment zone. Thank y'all so much for watching. If you found this video useful, don't forget to share with a friend and we will see y'all next time.